It's the Maxwell Institute Podcast. I'm Blair Hodges. Historian Richard Bushman joins us in this episode to get autobiographical about his biography of Joseph Smith, to talk about the rise of Mormon studies and the relationship between personal faith and professional scholarship. Richard Bushman's one of the most distinguished and respected historians ever to call the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints his religious home. That's one reason why the Maxwell Institute sponsored a scholar's colloquium in his honor, inviting an excellent lineup of scholars to talk about scholarship and faith. The proceedings of that gathering were recently published in a book called To Be Learned is Good, Essays on Faith and Scholarship in honor of Richard Lyman Bushman. You can see a video from that colloquium or learn more about the book at our website, mi.byu.edu slash Bushman. It was a real treat to sit down with Richard to talk about his career and his personal faith, his difficulties and successes in this episode of the Maxwell Institute podcast. Send questions and comments about this and other episodes to me at mipodcast at byu.edu. And take some time to rate and review the show on iTunes if you haven't done that yet. Really appreciate reading people's reviews. Here's one that we recently received from Mockhart75. It says, I've thoroughly enjoyed the depth and variety of topics and the authors and guests that are presented on this podcast. It not only offers intellectual food for thought, but I find it interesting and not so highbrow. I was I was glad to hear that. We we try not to be lowbrow. We try not to be too highbrow. We're kind of trying to be middle brow on the show. Um, Mockhart goes on to say, plus I'm learning so much more about my own religion as well as the beliefs of many others. Occasionally I've not enjoyed a speaker or sometimes the topic is less interesting, but for the most part it's well done. Well, Mockhart 75, uh, sounds like we have a pretty good batting average with you. I'm glad you listened to the podcast. I'm thankful that you took the time to uh, rate it and review it on iTunes and uh, hope that other people do the same. All right, with that being said, we turn now to our interview with Richard Lyman Bushman. We're talking with him today about faith and scholarship and his career and his life and Mormon studies and all sorts of things. Thanks for listening. Richard Bushman, thanks for joining us here on the Maxwell Institute podcast. It's a pleasure. We're here to talk about a book that just came out from the Maxwell Institute called To Be Learned is Good, Essays on Faith and Scholarship in Honor of Richard Lyman Bushman. This is a book that was put together by Spencer Fluman, Kathleen Flake, and Jed Woodworth. But I want to start off with the fact that you're about to put out another new book. This book is called The American Farmer in the 18th Century, A Social and Cultural History. And this book's coming out on May 22nd. Tell us a little bit about this farmer project. <laughs> it's strange because I have no farmers in my background until you go back three, four generations. Uh, but I became fascinated, starting with uh, Joseph Smith Sr. and his ancestors. So I got into it in the first place because I was writing on Joseph Smith and wanted to sort of recreate the world in which he lived, but became absolutely enamored of farmers, loved to talk to them, loved to visit them, loved to watch them at work. And so I sort of carried this farther than I'd intended. And uh, really, with no big question, no analytical purpose, I just wanted to recover the lives of, of ordinary farmers in the 18th century. So that's really a kind of a day-to-day a -day thing. What kind of records are you drawing on to get a picture for that? All kinds of records. Uh, there are some good diaries. I use them when they're available. There are some excellent letters. Uh, there are tax lists. Uh, there are a few almanacs. My aim was to use every kind of record that the farmers left behind in one form or another and extract from it what I could about their lives. Do you find yourself having to resist the temptation of favoring, say, a particular diary or something? Like sometimes a historian will find this source that's just rich and engaging yeah. and fun, and it's tempting to sort of just follow that down the rabbit hole. Oh, I yield to that temptation entirely. <laughs> I think that's all you can do is to take your very best sources, make everything you can out of it. And of course, you may not be typical, but there is no typical farmer. There is no such thing as a typical farmer. So you just have to get little patches uh, wherever you can and uh, blow them up and make them as good as you can make them. So out of the several monographs that you've written, where would you position this one in terms of being driven by your own personal interest? Is this compared to, say, Joseph Smith, Rough Stone Rolling or compared to your, your earlier book, um, Puritan to Yankee? Is that uh, the mm -hmm. name of that? Like, were they all 
kind of growing out of your own personal drive, or is one more personal to you than another? Well, my wife tells me that everything I write is autobiographical, and that's true. You can find reasons why I did it that coming out of my biography. Probably Farmers is the least of these. Hmm. I think it was Farmers was moved primarily by just an interest in sort of knowing them. I wanted to talk to them. What worries you? What do you hope for? What are your problems? And um, I don't, I, I can't find anything deeper than that, but I did fall in love. Another project that you've been working on for several years now uh, is a cultural history of the Golden Plates, the record that Joseph Smith, uh, Latter-day Saint prophet and founder of the church, said that he found in a hillside and, and is what became the Book of Mormon. How is this project coming along? It's coming along pretty well. I have about four chapters. Right now I'm working on a chapter that talks about trials of the plates. That is um, an effort to determine validity of the plates' existence, of Joseph Smith's authenticity as a prophet. So I'm talking about all these efforts to go back and see the three witnesses uh, after Joseph is dead and going to his home. People would gather in crowds around uh, Martin Harris and have him uh, bear his testimony money to them, so I'm trying to figure out what that means. But then I look at other attempts to test Joseph, the Kinderhook plates. Uh, Henry Caswell's effort to prove Joseph Smith was phony by tricking him into pretending to translate a Greek Psalter. And then uh, finally James J. Strang's plates. So there are this whole collection of evocations of plates in one way or another that were aimed at the question of determining validity of these people. So that's the chapter I've got in my mind right now, and I've done a few others, and I'll probably forge on for another uh, five or six chapters. Do any of the chapters talk about the plates as discussed within the text of the Book of Mormon as well? Yes, I've done some of that. Um, I've actually published an essay or two on um, the plates, which have an entirely different life inside the Book of Mormon than they do in Joseph Smith's time. They're not a sacred object in the sense of being unavailable to look at. They're not guarded. There's no sort of trespassing gaze to be be worried about. But uh, they have other functions in the Book of Mormon. I'm very, I'm very, very interested in that. When you do a project like this, you, your chapters are going to address a lot of different issues. Are there any particular chapters or topics within the context of this overall project that you're particularly drawn to or that you personally are really interested in more than any other aspect? Well, I'm interested in... Uh, in all of them, but I am interested in the conjunction with evidentiary Christianity, that is, the attempt to demonstrate the scientific truth of Christianity. There are scores of books of that kind, and the plates get involved in that uh, whole process of how do we prove that God lives. And that's interesting to me because it's for, for me, that is the essence of the, of the conflict with modernism. Modernism is the moment when the world is disenchanted, when we no longer believe the universe speaks to us, that there is no, no God out there. And that's you know, been an overarching cultural issue for uh, 250 years now. So I'm quite interested in the point where the plates enter into that, that discussion and debate. Well, I, I'm really looking forward to that. I know you've been working on it for a while. In fact, some of the summer seminars on Mormon culture that have happened here at the Maxwell Institute have, have revolved around that subject. And maybe spend just a second talking about those experiences now that you've moved on from the summer seminar. Um, what did that opportunity mean for you as a scholar to be able to do those seminars? Well, it was fabulous because uh, it's a great mistake to just uh, do your scholarship inside your own head because uh, you, you can get confused and, and mistaken. So to be able to bring in uh, 10 or 12 really uh, eager young people to talk about one a um, aspect of the plates or another uh, is really exciting. And they dig up stuff that you never dream. Chris Smith found um, people in the late 20th century who were hunting for plates, and even in the, late, in the early 21st century, People are still going out 
and trying to replicate the Joseph Smith experience by discovering plates uh, that an angel leads them to. I, I never knew that existed. Yeah. They found it. It's great. Yeah, you just get all these extra eyes sort of looking at the same types yeah. of questions you want. People can check those papers out there on the Maxwell Institute website. I'll leave a link in the show notes if people want to see some of the papers that grew out of Richard's uh, summer seminars uh, on Mormon culture. We're talking today with Richard Bushman. He's the Governor Morris Professor of History Emeritus at Columbia University. And you probably know him as the author of uh, the popular biography of Joseph Smith, Rough Stone Rolling. And we're speaking with him today in recognition of the release of a Feshrift that was just published in his honor called To Be Learned is Good, Essays on Faith and Scholarship in Honor of Richard Lyman Bushman. One other question about your current work and the shape of it over the course of your career. I want to talk to you about aging and scholarship. Do you think as you've aged, you're now an older distinguished scholar? Has your approach to scholarship changed much as a result of, of just getting older? Do you see yourself working in different ways or any of your familiar patterns mm -hmm. become less useful over time? Mm -hmm. I suppose so, though um, old people don't like to think of themselves as old. They <laughs> think they're just the same young whippersnapper they were at age 25. But um, I think what happens is you get a little more confident in the personal voice. Hmm. When you're young, you know, you don't want to make one misstep. Every word has to be sustained by a footnote. And I, I was very, very empirical. Uh, I didn't like to say anything that I couldn't demonstrate. But after you get older, you realize that to you come to appreciate the novelistic side of history writing, hmm. that you're really creating a time and a place and personalities. And you give yourself a little more leeway in um, venturing where your instincts lead you. And of course, readers love that because it makes it all more real and they like to see you exposing yourself. And when you're old and you're not bucking for tenure anymore, well, <laughs> you can just take the chance. <laughs> cool. Let's talk about Mormon studies a little bit now and how the academic study of Mormonism has changed during your lifetime. Do you see it? Uh, do you see your own career tracking alongside Mormon studies? Because in some ways you did a lot of things before you actually got mm -hmm. into Mormon studies in particular. Yeah. Yeah, I always felt like I lived a bifurcated life. I was essentially a colonial historian, early American historian. That's how I hi was hired. That's what I, my scholarship was. Was that happenstance, or did you know, like, this can also lead to Mormon stuff? I had in my mind that if I could gain some mastery of the period where Joseph Smith c came forth, it would be useful. If I, But I didn't do a lot of Mormon scholarship until Leonard Harrington asked me to do uh, the early biography of Joseph Smith. Yeah, Joseph Smith in the beginnings of right. Mormonism, right. I believe, yeah. So you're kind of establishing yourself in this career while Mormon studies is growing up. Where do you see Mormon studies? Where has it come from? What, what kind of developments have you seen through the course of your own career? Well, the first part, I think, was uh, for Mormon historians to win the respect of other historians. We all know how bifurcated uh, history was before, uh, say, World War II. Uh, actually, Von Brody was one who started to bring it together. Mormons don't like uh, No Man Knows My History, but it really was one of the more sympathetic biographies of Joseph Smith. And after that time, you have Leonard Arrington writing about Mormonism in the grand style of a huge monograph on the economic history of the church uh, in a way that was widely admired. And uh, it was our young PhDs, Tom Alexander and Jim Allen and so on, who learned to speak in that way mm -hmm. so that you could write and be respected and just join in rather than debating or clashing with uh, academic scholarship, which had always been true. I and mean, it always was a clash before uh, World War II. So that's been a pleasure to see that, that happen. And back uh, in the Arrington era, if we want to call it that, um, he also made an effort and other people made efforts to get more women involved in doing scholarship and women involved in, in Mormon studies as it came about. What are some differences you see between the kind of work that's being done now uh, on Mormonism and women versus how it kind of began? Because it's not just all these great new studies didn't just appear out of nowhere. 
they are important and new, but there's also a genealogy there. Talk a little bit about that genealogy. Yeah. Well, you have the wrong person behind the microphone there. Uh, Claudia is the one who lived that. Yeah. Uh, and as Laurel Ulrich has pointed out, the Mormon women in, in Boston were in the van of feminism in the 1970s when they got together, began to uh, talk about their lives, but also research the history of their people and uh, writing about the world and the church from a woman's perspective. And that's got stronger and stronger as time's gone by. There was an interesting event in there that I think is relevant to this question. They were asked to do a, an issue of dialogue. These women in Boston who were writing and gathering and talking, and they did, and they submitted it to dialogue. And the editor at that time said, uh, well, this is all fine, but you haven't talked about the important issue, women in the priesthood and polygamy. And uh, I think that was a relevant comment because it represents the sort of the two sides of Mormon female historiography. One is just trying to recreate Mormon life as it's lived. Mm -hmm. And the other is sort of activist reforming feminism that tries to change the church or change the lot of women. And I think those two were not there very much at the beginning. They've become more present in uh, recent times. Hmm. I want to ask as well, you have been involved with the Joseph Smith Papers Project. Uh, your involvement has decreased over the years, but you have been uh, with this project for a long time. And I was wondering, a lot of things have come out since you published Rough Stone Rolling. A lot of new things in terms of what the public has been able to easily access. Maybe I should qualify that. But how, has your view of Joseph Smith and your biography itself changed very much, given the additional information that's been made more available? Mm -hmm. It's a tremendous project and beautifully edited. The annotation is fabulous. It's almost unmatched in the scholarly world and will be of great benefit and a huge burden to future biographers of uh, Joseph Smith. I'm afraid I'm just a little bit too stuck in my own view of Pro Joseph Smith to really be reshaped. It is true, I read every volume before it's uh, published and that I'm, I read with great fascination and keep finding things I didn't know. But it hasn't reshaped my view of Joseph. Someone will have to do that hmm. later on. What it has brought out is that the, the most signal uh, uh, extension of our knowledge is in the legal realm. We find he was party to a suit so much of his life. He's constantly um, in court or uh, scheduled to go to court. And uh, the impact of legal language, I think, could be traced in all sorts of things from from sections of the Doctrine and Covenants to the temple to um, many parts of our of our literary heritage. That's fascinating. Yeah, the the legal papers aspect of the Joseph Smith papers continues to to roll out, and I guess people can keep an eye on that. That's a fascinating question to see how those interactions shaped the language and some of the ideas of the early church. When it comes to modern Mormon studies or Mormon studies right now in the academy, people hear about the establishment of Mormon studies chairs. Uh, you held one of these chairs at Claremont. I believe it was the first Mormon studies chair. Uh, is that right? Uh, the chair at uh, Utah State University preceded it in its uh, establishment. So Phil Barlow, I think, uh, really takes that honor. I should have known. He's here in the building. So yeah. apologies, Phil. Yeah. But yes, uh, then I was at Claremont. And um, people who aren't in the academy, how would you describe what a Mormon chair even does? What's the significance of one and, yeah. and why are they useful? Well, the idea of a chair is it's endowed, which means it's in perpetuity, which is a um, a, a bet or a gesture, both by the university and by Mormon donors to the effect that Mormonism always will deserve a place in academic discourse in a university. 
which is a huge forward step. It would be a lecture or a sidelight, but now we're going to say it deserves study the way other cultural groups deserve study. And so we have, uh, have them at uh, Utah State and the University of Utah, Claremont and the University of Virginia with others in the offing. So it's, um, it's something that's taking hold all over the country. My, Claudia, again, was the one who th thought of the idea when she found that at Columbia there were four chairs of Jewish studies. Mm. And uh, why couldn't we have one somewhere in the country? <laughs> now we have a few more than that. Do you see a time when that will kind of even out? Like uh, the trajectory right now is kind of – it's been heading up. We keep adding more. Do you see that yeah, kind of yeah. topping off? I think it's a question that has to be answered. Jewish studies, of course, are all over the country. Um, and it's a subject that, but of course, Jewish culture is much longer and richer than ours. So there may be other ways to use that money, research centers or uh, postdoctoral fellowships, or we have to think through what is the logical next step. Now, you published a column in the Deseret News and, and an opinion piece on radiant Mormonism. And one of the things that uh, might surprise people is you took a little time in there to talk about the philanthropic side of, of Mormonism and how through the Mormon Studies Chair at Claremont, you really became more aware of the possibilities and also some of the things that, that Mormons who have means are deciding to do with their money, mm -hmm. aside from supporting things like Mormon Studies Chairs and things. Yes, it's largely invisible uh, that we're taking care of, there are Mormons taking care of lepers, children in, in India, that there are schools, that there are nutrition systems all over the, the world in one way or, or another. And it's uh, not measured, it isn't even really conceptualized, but there, uh, in so many fields, in so many places, so many venues, Mormon influence is, is being felt. That's Richard Bushman. We're talking with him today about Mormon studies and other issues. Richard, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the shape of your own devotional life. Um, as a practicing Latter-day Saint, most people know most active Mormons do things like attend church, say prayers, read scriptures, and that sort of thing. Tell me a little bit more about the shape of your own personal devotional life, if you would. Maybe things that you read for devotion, ways that, you, ways that your relationship with God plays out in your own actions. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm always um, dissatisfied with my devotional life. It seems like I can never do do justice to the subject or the the importance of it. Uh, I pray a lot. Uh, the sacrament prayers is for me the heart and core of um, Mormon devotion, remembering the name of Jesus Christ and taking his name upon us. Um, I have a problem and I have a hope. The problem is that uh, the academic life kind of um, taints the devotional life because you become so accustomed to reading texts critically and aggressively. So you're always reading against the text. So I'm reading in Luke now when I read about the whole world should be taxed and everyone had to go to their own their own country, their own city. I think, really? <laughs> Is that the way they did taxation? Uh, were they really making people run all over the country? So it becomes a historical problem yeah. rather than the story of a couple who are put under difficult circumstances at the time of a ch birth of a child. And uh, so... Many versions of that trouble me. So I, I try to stop that, but I can't. Uh, that's just the way I read. I keep notes. every. I read the scriptures every morning, keep notes on my thoughts as uh, we go along. But th that's the problem side. Do you want to hear the yeah. other side? <laughs> yeah. It's good to hear. It's good now. It's good to hear the problem side too. I'm sure people can relate to that. So it's yeah. nice to hear someone. Uh, but but yeah, the, let's hear the the bright side. The other side of it is um, a sense that um, Charles uh, Taylor, the great Catholic philosopher of our day, speaks of flourishing, and that is these moments 
when you feel like there's something beautiful, really gorgeous and desirable beyond measure, some kind of intense goodness and beauty, and that if you just live in the right way or manage your mind or say some words or perform some actions, you can participate in that beautiful life. And I'm, I can't find words for it. Uh, Christ calls it the Pearl of Great Price. Some people call it testimony. I think the experience Mormons have when they say, I have a testimony, where they're often moved to tears, they just feel their body transformed, is close to what I'm, I'm saying, that it's the promise of something that's truly uh, godly. Um, that yearning to partake of that um, is uh, very strong. I can't live without it. I can't drop it. And it uh, overshadows all sorts of other supposedly rational considerations about faith um, because anything that leads in the direction of that kind of wonder and beauty uh, is um, very attractive to me. Has that changed over time for you much? It seems that that I might say this sounds like you're you're kind of expressing the core of your experience of Mormonism or what keeps you coming back to the well. Uh, and has that been similar for you this throughout your life? Uh, these type of experiences kind of keep keep you coming back? I didn't have a word for it. I could not have described it the way I have. But looking back, uh, I can see that that, that is there. Uh, I have this experience, it's one of those stories I've told a million times, but talking to our, the dean of the School of Religious Studies at Claremont asking me why I'm a Mormon, and my quick answer was, um, because when I live the Mormon way, I'm the kind of man I want to be. And that sense that I somehow was a better husband, a better father, my scholarship was better. I was just a better human being. Has been there for a very long time. Yeah, you relate that story and your contribution to the book "To Be Learned Is Good." Your essay, "Finding the Right Words," talks about how your faith has, kind of your experience of faith over your lifetime, especially uh, from the time just before your mission, through your mission, uh, and then after your mission, and kind of finding the right words to to understand your own faith. This is where it seems to me that the life of the mind can assist the experience of your, of your own soul, your own spirit. Because you talk about the downsides of maybe thinking about things too much or questioning things too much. But at the same time, is there a benefit for you in being able to sit back and, and even like take a bird's eye view of Richard Bushman and think about like looking at your life like a historian might. Do you spend time doing that at all? And, and is that related to this finding the right words to articulate what your faith looks like? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, maybe you can think too much, but it's uh, impossible for me not to think. Uh, it's the form of my devotion. I would never tell someone don't think too much. Um, I think you have to face up to your problems and your needs. And uh, you just have to hope that your thought will be infused by godly influences of some kind that will bring satisfaction and rewards. Um, so um, my, my own um, confrontation uh, begins when, you know, a Mormon boy from Portland, Oregon, raised in the classical Mormon way in a good loving family, family prayers, the whole works, and with faith and seeking, I was a seeking high school student who wanted to know God, live better, when I confront Harvard College, which I saw, you know, as this immensely learned place, very uh, well-informed, powerful minds gathered together and um, I had to find some way of finding my place because in the end, I tried to join that culture, that academic intellectual culture. 
Um, but uh, the first encounter, I quickly came to realize that my Mormon faith was not at home. It was alien to their way of thinking, foolishness, garbage, as uh, one professor told me. So I had to find a way. And for a while, the way was doubt. I thought that I couldn't believe anymore. Harvard wouldn't allow me to believe. Um, I you really, needed a different type of evidence to make it worth believing kind of a thing? Is that what well, it was? How in the world just... can you believe in a prophet who finds gold plates mm. in the hill? Yeah. I mean, it's just it's ridiculous. Yeah. You didn't have to be refuted. It was just so mm. out of the question on the surface of it. And for them, of course, uh, the same thing is true for most any about uh, God in any way would, that we would think of it. So I thought that they had beaten me out and that the best I could do was to be a agnostic. What I came to realize, as I d describe in this essay, that I wasn't disbelieving. I don't think I can disbelieve. I'm just just built in a way that I have faith. I just, it's just necessary for me. But that I couldn't find a way to explain to them what my faith was. And so it was really a matter of finding words, not to persuade them, never dent their the doubts of that culture, but to make myself a reasonable partner or conversational accomplice, you know, someone who could enter into the discussion uh, in a way that would, would make sense. So my whole life really has been devoted to finding the language that would permit me to talk to people uh, uh, from that that culture. In the book, To Be Learned is Good, you helped organize this conference or, or helped define the shape of it. And we have people in this book who are Latter-day Saints, but we also have scholars in this book who are not Latter-day Saints. So we have a stereotype of sort of the, un the unbelieving academy. And there are plenty of people in the academy who don't, um, don't experience or, or adhere to religious faith. What about this other side of the academy? The desire to find God is so powerful, so lasting <laughs> through many centuries of civilization that I think that yearning is there. And I do have colleagues who have confessed to me that, uh, that they are believers in some form or another. So, but I think at this moment, it's very hard to find language that for them and Mormon language won't do, of course, but uh, for them to find language to express their, their need for God. Yeah. Yeah, at Georgetown, I was, uh, I was blessed with the opportunity to meet several really thoughtful and engaging scholars and professors who also uh, adhere to religious faith. At, at Georgetown, most of them that I met were Catholic. Uh, and even though neither of us really... No, we didn't expect each other to convert to each other's faiths or to see eye to eye on every issue, but that almost mattered less to us than just being a believer alongside someone else, like having that community. Well, I, I agree with you. I think it used to be we our competition was with other denominations. You know, it was us versus the Catholics or us versus the Baptists. But I think that the lines of battle have changed now so that our allies are believers of all kinds. And certainly believing Catholics, we feel a, a kinship to them. I feel a kinship to believing Jews. And uh, I've had you know, many very good moments of uh, communion with people of that, that kind. Elder Neely Maxwell coined this term, disciple scholarship, a disciple scholar. How would you describe what that means? What does that mean to you? Well, um, I guess I, I would call myself a disciple scholar. I've always been a believer. I've been active in the church, never never wavered from my activity, never been really tempted to, to, to leave the church. In a strange way, I don't think that if you set out to say, I'm going to use my scholarship to demonstrate the church is true, either through the Book of 
Mormon or through Joseph's life, that somehow that will distort things and you won't succeed in what you're trying to do. What you have to do is say, I'm just going to try to find out what's true. I'm going to give my mind full reign. I'm going to look at every problem, every difficult. And while you're doing that, try to keep your heart pure so that you're speaking to God, so you're praying to God, so you're doing your duty, you're paying your tithing, you're doing everything you can to be a good person the way the church wants you to be. And then you just trust your mind. You just let it go wherever it wants. And I think the results will be much more effective in every way for church members and non-church members if you follow that system. There's this candid thing that you wrote in a book called On the Road with Joseph Smith. This is a little book that you put together uh, after Joseph Smith Rough Stone Rolling was published, and you kind of went on a book tour, which is the first time that I ever encountered you and, and, and found out who you were uh, at Weber State University. Uh, and in that book, you talk about how you had this hope that the biography of Joseph would be able to reach believing Latter-day Saints, and it would also be able to reach non-believing Latter-day Saints and kind of form this bridge where people where people could really understand each other. And, and there's a candid remark in there, too, that you, you said you felt like in some ways that goal, that you had failed at that goal. Do, do you remember writing that? I did in the sense that the response to the book is not people saying, okay, you've given me Joseph Smith. What they say is you've given me one Joseph Smith. It's a Joseph Smith they can understand and get inside, but it's not the Joseph Smith they're willing to accept. Mm -hmm. They'll go to Fawn Brody or probably for a Joseph Smith that is in their reality. It's just too much to bring them inside my world of belief and to accept the Joseph Smith that I, I present there. And one of the ways you tried to do that in Rough Stone Rolling was to represent Joseph Smith according to how Joseph Smith seemed to have understood yeah. what he was doing. Yeah. Right? And that's through records that he had created with no intention of public uh, yeah. reception or anything like that. I'm not disappointed with this outcome. I think it's a good outcome. It provides a basis for conversation. Mm -hmm. That's that's the preparation for Mormon Studies chairs, that Mormons can talk in a way that works inside an academy. If you can't do that, there will never be a Mormon Studies chair anywhere. But I was reading um, Karen Armstrong's biography of Muhammad. And I was taken by it. I got inside Muhammad. I didn't become a Mohammedan. I'm not sure I believe that Gabriel appeared to Muhammad, even though it's quite possible. But she had got me inside that world. Mm. And for me, that was a great achievement of hers, and I tried to emulate her. Rough Stone Rolling is still uh, is still a, a really important book in the in the historiography of, of Joseph Smith. Do you think do you think at some point another biography w will come about? Do you do you think Joseph Smith has been covered pretty well? No, he's uh, he's too large a figure to be ever covered pretty well. <laughs> I mean, he's like Jefferson and Washington or Hamilton. Uh, how in the world? Can anyone start out to write a new biography yeah. of Washington? But they do it all the time. <laughs> maybe a musical, too, with Hamilton. We yeah. could get a, a different kind of musical than the Book of Mormon musical. That's maybe. right. <laughs> I have a grandson who's an actor. All. <laughs> so, or yeah. it may very well turn up in a TV series or a movie. Sure. A lot of people would love to do that. Yeah. Yeah. I also wanted to ask you, you've spent some time meeting with Latter-day Saints in various places throughout the country sometimes in the context of a devotional setting or a fireside type setting where people are thinking about faith and their questions and their concerns. Have you noticed any common themes that tend to come up when you're taking questions from people? Well, there are a lot of questions, but it's sort of a matter of personal taste. Some can't stand the 14-year-old bride. Some are really knocked out for a loop by the Book of Abraham not being what Joseph said it was, um, uh, polygamy still troubles uh, lots of people. Uh, it just seems like people attach themselves to something that's distinctive uh, to them. So um, the, the big question for me is I've talked to those people and I never can get the, uh, an answer that truly satisfies me 
is, is there any of those things that would totally disqualify Joseph Smith to receive a revelation from God? If he married a 14-year-old girl, does that mean he could not really have been a prophet of God? Or if he thought the scrolls of Abraham were the writings of Abraham rather than a funerary script of some kind, does that mean the book of Abraham could not have been? So I'm, I'm always asking that, that question, and uh, I, I never get a fully satisfying answer to it. What do you offer people? What kind of ideas or thoughts do you offer to people who, who decide to step away from the church, decide to step away from Mormonism, yeah. and also to loved ones of people who, who step away? Well, p people um, will often come to me when um, their son-in-law is on the verge of leaving the church, or they are hoping that I can say something yeah. that will turn them around. I've decided after a decade of doing this that I can't. You know, there's no argument I can give. If I try to argue with them, it goes nowhere. It's like Bible bashing in the mission field. It never gets anywhere. So I don't do much of that. I, I agree with the facts of what people say. All these things did happen. So I don't can confute those things. What I wanted at first was them to see the possibility there might be another way of looking at them, that you don't have to see them as damning. But now I think more about this person's life and what that life is going to be like if they leave the church. How are they going to fill that hole, mend the relationships with their spouse or their mother or someone or other? And how do they sort of complete their personal life? So my most common question nowadays is, how do you feel about Jesus Christ? And if they say, he means everything to me. I say, you're going to be all right. Don't worry about all this other. You could, you know, fiddle with it if you like and worry about it. But um, if you can hold on to Jesus Christ, you'll be okay. More often than not, people give up on everything. They give up on God. They give up on prayers. They give up on Christ. And that's, uh, that's a great concern to me. So my hope is that... Uh, they'll find some other way to anchor their lives and, and listen to their spiritual impulses. Because to shut them off entirely, I think, um, distorts their, their personalities. So that's the direction I go. How do you respond to, to Mormons who remain in the church that have loved ones leave? What kind of, what kind of things do you advise there in terms of how to, how to keep, you mentioned relationships yeah. and how important those are. Yeah. The greatest fear of these people um, when they leave the church is they'll break the hearts of their mother or somebody. You're afraid of what it's going to do to your family relations. So um, we've had children who are no longer active in the church, and we have this uh, motto that you can leave the church, but you can't leave the family. And that has to govern everything. You can't let your kids leave the family. You can't do things that drive them out of the family by annoying them or trying to argue with them. You just have to keep them in the family. That's the number one priority and exceeds all others by uh, light years. Hmm. That's Richard Bushman. We're talking with him today about his work on things like farmers, on things like the Golden Plates, on a book that just came out called To Be Learned is Good, Essays on Faith and Scholarship in Honor of Richard Lyman Bushman. Before we go, I also wanted to talk to you about one more thing, the Mormon Arts Center. You and your spouse, Claudia, have both been involved in in the creation or development with other people of a Mormon arts center in New York City. So talk to us a little bit about this new effort of yours. And by the way, Phil Barlow told me that he had a really hard time getting you to read a novel with him. And so he thinks it's really interesting that now you're, you're, you're kind of like hopping into the arts at this point. <laughs> well, it does seem strange. I've devoted my life to history of all sorts and ending at the, with church history. But uh, suddenly when someone said to me, what is the greatest cultural need in the church? 
I spent a few months thinking about it and talking to people. I finally came to the conclusion that uh, developing our artists and appreciating our artistic tradition was so that Mormons were seen as artists or, or appreciators of art, that that was the goal that was worth working on for the time being. So there's someone in New York who's been doing this for years and we've hooked up, Claudia's involved, and we've brought a few others into it. And our aim is to, uh, it's, our, our motto is illuminating and celebrating Mormon arts. And so we're trying to go back to the beginning, 1830, and discover the artistic tradition, make ourselves aware of it, because we're hopelessly ignorant of our own artistic tradition. There, we have discovered 1,600 Mormon composers. Uh, hmm. 100 of them have PhDs in music, one form or another. So the arts are there for our, we've had an arts festival last June, we have another one coming up. We're bringing in a, an Angolan Mormon who has shown his work all over Europe. He's been in the Venice Biennial twice. He's an eminent art, artist, and he says his art is his expression of God and the spiritual forces in the universe. So we're going to put up his art. Uh, we're going to bring in a Chinese composer who earned the Prix de Rome, which is the highest prize given in music. And uh, she will be there and her work will be f performed. So we're doing the best we can to bring this work forward and uh, help us to realize we've got something that's truly wonderful in our, our artists in the past and now. Where can people go to learn more about these efforts? Uh, we have a website, Mormon Arts. We're doing all kinds of arts. Art, MormonArtsCenter.org. And uh, we will have our festival at, on the Columbia University campus on June 28th to 30th. Tabernacle organ, organists are going to come out to perform on Columbia's great Eolian Skinner organ in St. Paul's Chapel. We'll have a two-day um, series of events, all of them exciting at the uh, Casa Italiana on the, uh, more on the Columbia campus. So it's going to be a great occasion. Sounds like a lot of fun. A lot of fun. Well, Richard, appreciate you taking the time to talk to us today on the Maxwell Institute podcast. Thank you. I think you do a great thing here, Blair. You're to be congratulated. Thanks. And thus concludes episode 75. We made it to 75. Can you believe it? Take some time to rate and review the show on iTunes. There's never been a better time than the present. 